Hi, it's me, Ryan. And the first thing I'll mention is if you don't want to listen to me talk for the next little while, I'll let you know I actually have another version of this video that has no commentary and nothing but action and the sweet sounds of woodworking. There's a link in the description below that'll take you right to that one. But if you plan on sticking with me in this one, what we're going to do is walk through my process in turning a couple old barrels into a solid oak end grain butcher block. I'll also share my thoughts on the topic of whether or not oak is an appropriate wood to use in cutting boards, and of course, no good woodworking project is complete without a couple little snafus along the way. So stay tuned for all that. So I thought since this is a project I only plan on doing once and one that I haven't seen done anywhere else that there might be some value in talking through the experience. I figure if I share my process it might give you some ideas on what or what not to do if you happen to have a barrel or two kicking around. We've all seen old barrels repurposed into things like flower planters, Adirondack chairs, and of course the whiskey barrel bar. While these all look like fun projects, I wanted to have a go at something that I hadn't yet seen and something that was a little more in line with the type of work that I like to do. In case you're wondering where the barrels came from, the answer is that I have a pretty good relationship with my local distillery. They make some excellent products, they've won many awards, and are well known around the world to folks who are passionate about such things. I'll leave a link to their website below if you happen to be one of those passionate folks, you can go check it out. Anyways, I take in their old barrels from time to time with the intent to repurpose them and give them a new life as something other than a barrel. I've got a few more to work through, and if you have any ideas of what I should do with them, please let me know down below in the comments. Originally, my intent was to take apart just one barrel and see how far that got me. Initially, I didn't plan on making this block as big as I did, but the first barrel fell apart on me prematurely before I could capture the cinematic effect that I was after. You know, the one where you lift the head off and all the staves fall outwards in a circle. So I grabbed another barrel, removed some rings, and kept the necessary ones on to hold it together, and I removed the head a little more carefully this time, got into position for the big moment, and there we go. That is pretty satisfying. Looking at one barrel's worth of staves and how much good lumber I was going to get from them, I could sense that one barrel wasn't going to get me the size of block I wanted, and even though two barrels worth would yield one a little bigger than I needed, I always like to err on the side of, well, bigger. So I added in the staves from the barrel that fell apart before I wanted it to, and I also left the barrel heads out of this project. They are doweled together and easy enough to pry apart and remove the dowels, but the holes that are left are impossible to avoid having show up in the end grain strips. Here's a past project I did to show you what I mean. I ended up filling the dowel holes with epoxy in this board, and I wanted to avoid that problem altogether on this build, so I set them aside and I'll just have to think of a different project for those. From here, it was a pretty messy job and honestly a bit of a grind to get through all the milling needed to turn the staves back into usable lumber. The first step was to take the curve out of each one, and I did that on the miter saw by laying it flat and aligning the blade to where the staves started to curve up. I sliced it there, flipped it around, and sliced it again. Essentially I just cut four or so inches out of the middle of each one. I briefly entertained the idea of some sort of steam bending method, but that would have been an entire project on its own, and I've learned to be really careful about starting a new project when you're mid-project on something else. Things can spiral quickly when you're always starting but never finishing, so I quickly abandoned that idea and just stuck with the miter saw. The sequence of events to get the wood ready for the first glue up is miter saw, jointer, planer, miter saw, table saw. So here at the jointer, which as you can tell is not exactly a state-of-the-art machine, I took four light passes off the uncharred side of each stave. By light, I mean a sixteenth of an inch, so in total I took a quarter inch off one side of each stave, which gave me a flat enough surface that it would ride along the planer bed. Four passes of around a hundred pieces of wood took a little bit of time, and as you would imagine, my jointer knives took a bit of a beating. And then it took even more passes at the planer to shave through the charred layer to get to the good stuff. I don't remember how many times I fed them all through, but I'd have to say at least six. I'd put them all through, then lower the planer, put them all through again, lower, repeat. This could have probably been done in less passes, but I've had this planer for six years now, and it's kind of in the twilight of its career, so I try to go easy on it. It's been an excellent little machine, but coming at it hot and heavy with a big stack of dirty oak could be the straw that breaks the planer's back. I'm thinking another way this uh, would have been done in less passes, or could have been done in less passes, was to actually take more passes on the jointer, but with the charred side down. 
That would likely ease the job of the planer and make a lot less of a mess, and I'll likely try that next time I'm milling up some staves. Another method I thought of that might make this easier is if you had one of those Makita wheel sanders with a wire brush attachment. I imagine you could use that to clean up the charred side of each stave before starting any of the milling, and that would save you from having char residue all over your jointer and planer. I don't think the char hurts the blades as there's no real structural integrity to it. It's the dense brick-like oak below the char that does a number on the knives. I think this project is a great example of the essence of woodworking, which is to take some wood, cut it into smaller pieces, and then use some glue to assemble it back into larger pieces. I spent about 10 hours total whittling these staves down into much smaller pieces of wood before I was ready to start building them back up again. This was the last step before heading to the table saw. They had been planed as much as they needed, but each one still had the remnant of a dado cut from where the barrel head fit into, so I trimmed the tails off of each one just above that cut. By the way, a cardinal rule of woodworking is to work with wood that has been properly dried. If you don't, you risk things like gaps, cracks, warping, and bowing down the road as the wood continues to reach equilibrium with its environment. I've read that the ideal moisture content for woodworking is 6-8%, to and the moisture content of these staves was around 14%. In no way did I think I was going to be the one that finally overcame the laws of nature, and I fully accepted that this block would see some movement in the coming months as the moisture continues to leave the oak. What I could have, and probably should have done to avoid potential wood movement, was dismantle the barrel, clean up the staves, and then allow them to further dry out until they were, well, what they needed to be. But I didn't want to wait six months in between taking the barrel apart and building the block, so I will fully accept the consequences as they come. This block is in my kitchen and I get to look at it every day, and maybe we'll do a follow-up video in a year's time on how it's holding up. Before heading back to the table saw, I had to give my little mobile outfeed table a quick cleanup with my Rotex and some 60 grit sandpaper. I've had this sander for about a year now, and as hard as it was to hand over the money for it, it really is worth every penny. It's the 6 inch version, and if you sand as much end grain as I do, it's such a game changer. By the way, the starting thickness of the staves was 7 eighths of an inch, and once we get through to the final planing, I'll share what the final thickness ended up being. At the table saw, I trimmed both sides of each stave, and since each stave was a little bit different in width, I was adjusting my fence a lot to preserve as much material as I could. I sliced through these with a 30 tooth glue line rip blade. It's an excellent blade that does just what the name suggests, creates a perfect glue line that ensures a tight seam. There's a link to that blade in the Amazon links below. If you're interested in checking out any of the stuff I use in my shop, you'll likely find it through those links, and if you don't, chances are it's simply not on on Amazon. The last step before glue up was arranging the staves. I wanted this block to be at least 24 inches wide and since the step after glue up involves the planer and my planer can only handle 13 inches. That's what she said. <laughs> each of these layers of staves represents two panel glue ups in the same set of clamps. You'll notice the pencil lines that I have on the rows. This is an easy way to keep everything aligned during glue up because once you have glue on everything and don't remember how things are meant to go together and you don't have a pencil line to remind you, the stress level instantly goes up. Type Bond 3 is my glue of choice and in my opinion the best glue to use for cutting boards. It's got great open working time before it starts to set up and once it's dry it's waterproof. My process for glue ups is pretty standard. I use a simple 10 millimeter painter's nap and roller to apply the glue. To start, I get it nice and saturated with glue and then simply roll the glue on the glue edges. After every use, I wash the roller out with hot soapy water and I can get dozens of glue ups out of just one of those. I use calls to keep everything flat and to prevent bowing from the pressure of the bar clamps. I have most of my calls wrapped in uh, masking tape, but for the few I don't, I make sure I put something in between my wood call and the wood glue up, otherwise they don't come apart without some damage being done. In this case I'm using thinly cut strips of 6mm construction plate poly. It's about $25 for a roll from Home Depot and it lasts me a very long time, like well over a year. I reuse the strips as much as I can before I have to scrap them, and although you don't see me doing it here, I do typically put those strips between the clamps and the wood as well, uh, with the intent to keep my clamps as clean and as free gliding as I can. 
Once I have everything in the clamps, I stick everything in this crudely built insulated box. The sole purpose of which is to keep things at room temperature while the glue sets. Currently my shop isn't heated and although the winters here on Vancouver Island are some of the most mild in Canada, it still gets down to single digits Celsius and this is simply my work around this winter. Is it perfect? No, of course not, but it does what I need it to do. I typically leave things in the clamps for 24 hours before stripping everything. However, whenever possible, I like to scrape the excess glue and I'll do this about one hour after the glue up. I'll strip all the gear off, scrape everything, then put all the gear back on until the next day. But sometimes I get things glued up at the end of the day and instead of sticking around to do that step, I'll leave them until the next day, which was the case here. It's not the end of the world if this happens, but if you can get that glue scraped at one hour's time, I recommend it. It's a simple step that just makes life a little easier for you and for your planer. And when the glue is this dried, all I can really hope for is to knock down any high spots. To keep track of which panels go together, I labeled the end grain of each one. That way I don't have to worry about keeping things all that organized while sending them through the planer over and over again. And this time around I took even lighter passes, closer to a 32nd of an inch. This part of the process simply just took time and patience. I just kept feeding them through and ever so slightly lowering the planer until all the panels were flat. Oh, by the way, these panels are all approximately 14 inches long and as mentioned, after final planing, these panels ended up being 9 16 thick, down from uh, original thickness of 7 8 One quick stop at the table saw to run each panel through just once to ensure the glue edges in the final seam are what they need to be, and then back over to the glue up table to join each pair of panels into one. Since I'm only doing one seam this time around, breaking out the goo, the goo, the glue roller, it really isn't necessary. This little Rockler silicone uh, glue brush works very well, and yes, you might be thinking, a little heavy on the glue there, bud. And yeah, I totally agree. My glue bead was a lot thicker than it needed to be, for sure. But I do always apply glue to both glue faces. This is another one of those eternal debates. I've heard lots of arguments for both sides, and personally I like to ensure both faces get the exact same treatment to ensure they perform exactly the same. The first time applying glue to both sides was explained to me was when I went through trade school. My carpentry instructor explained it like this. When applied to both faces, the glue seeps into the fibers of the wood on each of the faces. When the seam comes together, the glue bonds with the glue. If the glue has been allowed to penetrate the fibers on both sides of the seam, it'll make for a maximum strength glue joint from the depth of the fibers on one side all the way across to the depth of the fibers on the other side. And that made sense to me, and it still does. Whereas if you picture applying glue to just one side of the glue seam and it penetrates the fibers on one side but not as much on the other, the integrity of the joint, in theory, isn't as strong as it could be. Now with all that being said, we are most likely splitting hairs with this whole debate. Even a half-cocked glue joint becomes stronger than the wood fibers themselves. I wonder if there's any sort of official test out there that could put this debate to rest. I haven't dug too deep into the internet looking for one, but for now I'll keep on gluing both sides of the seam. Once everything's out of the clamps, I take care of the single glue seam on each panel with the belt sander. If I had a massive planer, I would send them through that, or if I had a drum sander, I'd use that to clean up the seam. But since I spend my money on organic groceries, I don't have either of those tools, and using a belt sander is a totally viable way to do this as long as you're careful. I use 60 grit because I like to live on the edge. <laughs> 80 grit would be totally suitable for this job as well, it would just take a little bit longer. You'll notice I don't just go back and forth over the seam until it's gone. If I did just that, I would sand a trench into my panel and it would cause all sorts of nasty gaps to appear after cross-cutting these panels and flipping them up into the end grain strips. Every time I take a pass across the glue seam, I'll go over the entire panel. Think of it like this, removing a microscopic layer of wood across the entire piece until the glue seam has been taken care of. Now here's another slightly unorthodox thing I do. To put a square edge on these panels, most folks would use a crosscut sled at a table saw or some sort of a track saw. I've never actually built myself a crosscut sled, nor am I convinced that I could build one large enough for two foot long panels. And I also don't own a track saw at this point in time, so I simply use my band saw. As long as I don't veer way off my pencil line, this method works quite well. I'll have a few strips in my final glue up that have some bandsaw marks on the end grain, but that doesn't matter to me because they'll get taken care of when I flatten the final block in the router sled. And to be honest, I love using this bandsaw every chance I get, and the more practice following pencil lines with the blade is really never a bad thing. 
if you're still with me, I think that means that either my voice has lulled you off to sleep or I've managed to keep your interest this long. If the latter is the case and you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, I'd be honored if you did. And if you wanted to go one step further and hit the little bell beside subscribe, that'll let you know when I have a new video come out. And if you want to go one step further than that, I welcome you to hit the thumbs up button, which would put me in the good graces of the almighty YouTube algorithm. I wanted the finished thickness of this block to be a full 3 inches and I needed to account for what the router would take off during flattening. So I set the fence at 3 and 1 8 of an inch and proceeded to slice up all the panels. I swapped out my 30 tooth glue line rip blade for an 80 tooth fine finish blade. Coupling that with a zero clearance insert plate in the table saw ensures that I have zero chip out which helps big time with the final glue joints. This is always an exciting part of the process for me because it's where I get a good first look at all that oaky end grain. Because honestly, I love oak end grain. It really sets itself apart from all the other woods. It's also at this point where my vision of the finished board becomes that much more clear. This is the largest solid oak project I've ever done and although oak is definitely not the easiest hardwood to work with, I do find it to be one of the most rewarding. Which brings me to a question I get asked all the time. I've heard oak isn't good to use in cutting boards. Is that true? And the first thing I'll say is this is a topic that could be an entire video on its own and one where we'd probably be more confused after watching it. I do think that white oak is a perfectly acceptable wood to use and the reason being is that from the research I've done, oak is one of the most antimicrobial woods out there, along with pine, although I wouldn't recommend using most softwoods in cutting boards. The easy to believe idea that oak is a poor choice because of bacteria getting lodged in its large pores and festering, I think, is a myth. Unlike a plastic cutting board, bacteria doesn't survive long on wood. I've read from numerous places now that something like 90% of bacteria dies off within minutes of being on the surface. And with proper cleaning and care, the rest is easily taken care of. We also need to remember that end grain itself has antimicrobial properties. As the vertical wood fibers rebound to resume their natural position, they push out anything that's trying to make its way in. Now, I've specified white oak as opposed to red oak. Personally, I wouldn't use red oak in an end grain application simply because the pores are so large that you can almost see through them. Whereas with white oak, although with pores larger than most other wood species, it's still considered a closed pore wood. On top of all of this, if you routinely wax your board and keep the wood sealed up, you add another layer of protection. The last thing I'll say is, like anything else on the internet, you'll need to separate the wheat from the chaff yourself, and that although I've decided white oak is great to use and I'm going to continue using it, I'll caution you to do your own research to arrive at a decision that's best for you. Before I pull the glue roller out one last time, I make sure the strips are sorted just the way I like, and to do this I just simply move things around until things look good to me. When you take apart a barrel and start chewing into the staves, you find a few hidden gems with some pretty interesting grain, and I actually set a few pieces aside earlier on in the process that I felt would be a shame to use up an end grain, but I also left a couple of those in with the intent to show off some of that gorgeous edge grain on the side of this block. Once everything is just the way I like it, a quick pencil line makes sure that it goes back together quickly. This was a massive glue up, and even my 5 foot long table wasn't enough to handle all the pieces at once. Now here, I am very liberal in how much glue I use. These are thick pieces, and I probably pushed it past the recommended 10 minute open working time by at least a few minutes. The last thing I wanted, and I've learned this a few times the hard way, is to come back the next day to visible gaps where I simply didn't get enough glue, and that's always a bummer. Now, that can probably be avoided if everything is milled absolutely perfectly and everything goes together perfectly tightly, if that makes sense. And although I did my absolute best to get as close to perfect as possible, I'm limited by the machines and tools I have at my disposal, so I go a little heavy on the glue just to make sure it squeezes into all the places it needs to. I'd rather have a few dollars of glue left on my table than a few gaps in my glue up the next day. And no, I don't scoop the glue up and put it back in the jug. I just let it dry and scrape it off into the garbage. I know, it's wasteful, and I'll acknowledge that. On this glue up, along with the calls, I utilize two large chunks of wood on either end. This is so when I go to clamp everything tight, the clamping pressure is distributed evenly. If I didn't use those and put the clamps directly on the oak and tighten them, there's a good chance I would cause the strips to bow, and once the glue sets, there is no unbowing of things. And I've learned this the hard way in the past, and it's something that I find is easily noticed in the finished product. 
And speaking of learning things the hard way, this is a great example of why to put some sort of barrier between your clamps and the glue. I'm not really sure why I skipped that little step on this entire project. Once again, I got this glued up at the end of the day, so it sat overnight without the standard scraping at the one hour mark, and it took a little bit of coaxing with a rubber mallet there to remove the clamps, and it will take a little bit of scraping to clean those clamps up once the glue is dry. So just a great reminder to put something in between, whether it's plastic, wax paper, painter's tape, or tuck tape. Something is much better than nothing. Speaking of all those things, here's one more example of where they would be helpful. Between black pipe clamps and glue. This is the reason the majority of my clamps are just the regular galvanized steel. The coating has a chemical reaction with the glue and it penetrates into the wood fibers and it's near impossible to sand out because it gets in there pretty deep. But I was confident this would come off in the router sled. It's always way more satisfying to get a good glue scraping in at the one hour mark when the glue has just started to cure. At this stage it's almost pointless, but I took a couple minutes to knock down any high spots and even with the amount of glue I used I still noticed I had a couple areas of opportunity. Again this really goes back to what happens during the milling process and maybe even during my belt sanding process. It was slightly annoying to see this, but I wasn't too worried about it as there were a few other areas in the grain itself that I'd be busting out the CA glue and activator to take care of. I leave the final glue up in the clamps for 24 hours and then I let it sit and breathe out of the clamps for at least 48 hours before I flatten. I actually brought this block home with me and let it sit for 3 more days in a room temperature environment before flattening. And this time allows for any residual moisture in the glue to escape and the block to relax after having been under clamping pressure. I find if you rush into flattening a board, there's a chance the wood will move after flattening and your board will no longer be flat. With that being said, let's remember that due to the moisture content, this block is likely going to have some movement anyways. But in an ideal scenario, I think it's wise to give the board a few days before flattening. There's a few different methods for flattening. You could send this thing through a drum sander, or if you're lucky to have a CNC, that's an excellent option too. I would strongly advise against sending an end grain board through the planer. In a split second, the knives can grab and yank at the vertical wood fibers and cause some serious damage or even injury. My router sled isn't anything fancy. It's a couple plywood rails and a sled built out of MDF that fits my Makita router. All of these are used together on top of a flat surface, which in this case is a workbench I built specifically for this purpose. I'm using an inch and three quarter Freud double flute straight bit and it works well. I find if the bit is nice and sharp and I go slow enough, the tear out on the end grain is minimal, but if I go too slow, burn marks will appear, so you gotta find that nice in between. I'm not worried about the chip out around the edges as I'll be cleaning those up afterwards and honestly I love this part of the process. It's satisfying to carve through the hard outer glue crust and down to the oak bedrock below. It's considered a form of crazy talk to say you're excited to sand end grain oak but I'm honestly not lying when I say I was starting to look forward to the sanding. A few minutes on each side with 60 grit in the belt sander makes quick work of the marks left from the router bit. Again I'm careful to go over the whole surface in a consistent manner. I often get asked why the pencil scribbles, what does that do? And this is exactly why and exactly what it does. The pencil marks show me where I've sanded enough and where I've missed. It's a tried and true method of ensuring a consistent sand across the surface. To square up the edges, I once again headed back to the bandsaw. At three inches thick, this would nearly max out my table saw blade without a crosscut sled. So it was a simple matter of drawing on some square lines and following them as closely as I could while I maneuvered that beast of a block through the blade which had a lot more weight to it there than the panels did when I was squaring those up. But I think I made out all right here. After that final trip to the bandsaw, I stopped by the jointer to clean up all four edges. As usual, I'm taking very light passes here on each side, and each time the back end of the board enters the cutter head, I slow it right down simply to minimize or altogether avoid chip out on the back end as the knives exit the wood. This project has done a number on the knives, and I'm not getting the most pristine finish on these edges, but it's nothing that won't be taken care of during the sanding. Next I hit everything again with 60 grit, but this time with the Rotex, and this ensures I get rid of any scratches left behind by the belt sander. It doesn't take long to do this with 60, but I found if I go straight to 80 grit in my Rotex after 60 grit in my belt sander, I'm sanding for what feels like an eternity just to get rid of the belt sander marks. 
I wanted both sides of this block to be usable. One side would be for all the various chopping and slicing that one normally does, and the other side would be specifically for carving up meat. So naturally, one of the sides needed a juice groove, and I actually had to build up my groove rails to be able to put a groove in this one. Before this, they were good for boards up to 2.5 inches tall, and obviously I just needed a bit more height on this one. I used a 3 8 of an inch round nose bit in my old router to carve grooves in the boards that I built. I typically do them in 4 passes, but for this one I actually did it in 5. The first pass is a very light pass where I break the skin of the board. I go a little deeper on the next few, and then for the final pass I go very light. The question I get most about juice grooves is how to avoid burn marks in the corners. There's a few things that I do. The first of which is I don't start in the corners. It's tempting to start there because that's where you feel most secure with the router, but anytime the bit hovers in one spot, it's going to burn the fibers. I get my bit down, locked in, and get the router moving as quick as I can somewhere in between the two corners. It's much easier to send out a burn mark in a straight line than it is in a corner. I also try to move as fluidly as I can around the corner, which can be nerve wracking, especially if you've ever had your router skip and plow way off course before. Doing a juice groove presents a great opportunity to mess up many hours of hard work in a split second. Normally I just ease the edges of my boards with some sandpaper and a block, but I thought this one would look nice with a small profile, so I whipped out the palm router with a chamfer bit and added a little chamfer to both sides of the board, and I'm glad I did as I think it suits the board. Since I wanted to be able to use both sides of this block, I wasn't able to router in the standard finger holds that I normally do, and to be honest, I didn't think finger holds were the right way to go for a board that weighs this much, uh, so I thought why not go with something decorative? I picked up a couple black stainless steel gate handles from my local hardware store, and I've had a couple folks let me know how they really feel about these in the comments on the other video, but at the end of the day, I like them, and they make flipping the board around a lot safer than trying to do so with just my fingertips in some grooves on the side. Wow! What a hole! The last step before I got to all the sanding was to address all the little gaps and crevices, the most of which are just voids in the oak end grain itself, but as we've seen before, there was a couple small gaps from the glue joints that didn't close up as tightly as I would have liked. When doing this with end grain, I highly recommend doing everything you can to get the glue into just the void and not in the fibers around the void. Just like the black coating on the clamps, the glue will seep down into the fibers and it's really difficult to try and sand out without leaving a divot in your board. With 60 grit out of the way, 80 grit is next. The sequence of events is spritz, scribble, sand, repeat. I spritz with water to raise the grain and once dry I'll scribble a pencil line on and then sand it off. I repeat that process through all the grits all the way up to 400. Is there anything to be gained from raising the grain in between every grit? I can't say for sure, but I do feel like it gives me a smoother surface in the end. A common problem with end grain boards is after they are all finished you can run your hand across them and feel the fibers are rough or the glue joints have popped up, and there's not much that can be done about that after the fact. I found that the potential for that happening can be eliminated by allowing the board to fully dry out before flattening, but also by raising the grain and the glue joints during the sanding process. You raise them up, knock them back down, and for the time it takes, I do believe it's worth doing. I typically switch from Rotex mode to Orbital mode after 150 grit, and then between 180 and 220 I'll pause on the Orbital and take care of all the hand sanding, which I typically wrap a 180 grit disc around a sanding block and hit all the edges with that. For doing the groove, there's no real shortcut around it, you just have to get in there and grind away until all the sharp edges are gone. My strategy is to get the worst out of the way first, so I'll start by taking care of the four corners, and then I'll roll up my sandpaper and hit everything in between. After 220 grit, I'll fire up my branding iron. Now, this isn't my logo or anything, it's just a fun iron I had custom made back in early 2020 when the world was shutting down. It's from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and it's the elvish ruin for hope. It takes me about 5 solid minutes to heat this thing up hot enough, and a trick I recently learned was to wet the wood first before pressing the iron to it. That helps minimize the yellowing that you get when you press it onto dry wood, and it just makes for an all around crisper looking brand and less sanding needed to clean it up. After this, it was just a matter of cruising through the final two grits, 320 and 400. Another thing I get asked often is if I have any advice for sanding end grain, and the only other secret I have besides what I've already shared is that it simply demands patience. End grain is its own beast, and it takes a little while to tame. I do my best to be methodical about it and move the sander slowly across the board just fast enough to watch my pencil lines disappear. 
It's a tedious task and it is tempting to move the sander quickly back and forth and all over the place to make it feel like it's going faster, but I think that actually makes things take longer. Honestly, I just make sure my headphones are fully charged and that I have a good podcast or audiobook queued up. Or sometimes I'll just put some music on and listen to it in the background of my thoughts. The hard truth is that sanding end grain just takes time. And what I do after the final grit and before oil is use compressed air to get rid of any residual sawdust. And after nearly 40 hours of work, the time came to watch a stack of barrel staves come back to life in a different form. On one side of the board, I tried out a new to me wood serum by Bumble Shoots. That's a fun one to say. And I really liked the finish it gave me. It's coconut oil based and went on silky smooth. And I'm using an oil and wax foam applicator from Clark's to spread it around the board. I used some regular mineral oil on the other side of this board for simply again the cinematic effect. The wood serum was excellent stuff, but I wanted a good transparent shot of the oil soaking into the wood, and I'm so glad I intentionally put strips with some of the more characteristic grain on the outside of the board. I saturated the surface with oil as much as it needed until no more soaked in, and then I let things sit for about 20 minutes before wiping off the excess. After that, I let the board sit for a full 24 hours before massaging on a coat of beeswax, also from Bumble Shoots. Once it was all waxed up, the second last thing to do was attach the handles with the fasteners that came with them. These were number 10 screws, and even though I had pre-drilled the holes, they needed a bit of torque to go in, so I used my impact driver. And the very last thing to do was to stand back and admire what I had just done with a couple barrels. This was a fun project for the simple fact of taking an old wooden object and transforming it into an entirely different wooden object. This butcher block used to be a couple barrels, and those barrels used to be a couple trees. It's pretty cool what we can do with a natural resource and how many lives we can give it through repurposing the material. The options are truly endless, and it's no wonder so many of us are obsessed with woodworking. Like I said in the beginning, I don't think I would ever do something like this again, but I've also learned never say never. If I did, I would certainly apply a few key lessons to the next one, like not gluing my clamps to the wood and giving the staves the appropriate amount of time to dry out. But since I was building this for my kitchen, I wasn't too concerned about any wood movement, and like I mentioned, maybe we'll revisit this project in a year's time to see how it's aged and address anything that needs to be addressed. And that's how I turned two barrels into a butcher block. Thanks so much for following along and hopefully you found some value in this. If you have some questions that didn't get answered throughout this video, please feel free to ask them in the comments below and I'll be sure to follow up with you. If you know someone that would get some value out of this, please go ahead and share this with them. And I'll see you on the next one where I turn this butcher block back into two barrels. Nah, I'm kidding, but I will see you on the next one. Until then, take care.